Ladies and gentlemen, Ukraine is a fiction. Bosnia is a fiction. Kosovo is a fiction. COVID is a fiction. You don't, you don't have to believe me. You can read Thierry's excellent book if you haven't done so already. The European Union is a fiction. It is a fiction that you can solve a debt crisis with more debt. Everywhere you look, in the major policy decisions uh, that have been taken by all Western governments over the last two decades, you find fiction. I'll explain in a minute what I mean and why they are fictions. But they all have one thing in common. All these fictions are created for a purpose. And that purpose is control. Uh, Thierry has just referred, and we all are aware of this, to the totalitarian or quasi-totalitarian nature of our Western societies. They are totalitarian because they are based on a fiction, on various fictions. And if those fictions were to be questioned, as they occasionally are, then the control for which they are the pretext would disappear. And that's why there is so much censorship and so much control. That's why one of the first sanctions announced after the Ukraine war started was, of course, the uh, closing down of RT and Sputnik uh, in Europe. All of these fictions are the creation of a virtual reality, the true purpose of which is to exercise control. Now, I started with Ukraine. I'll, I'd like to explain what I mean about Ukraine in a minute. Uh, but so that you understand what I'm trying to uh, get at, I would like to say a few words about Bosnia and Kosovo. Bosnia and Kosovo, which as you all remember, are territories over which NATO fought wars in 1995 for Bosnia and in 1999 for Kosovo. Uh, those two territories are fictions. Why do I say they're fictions? They are fictions because they are uh, they purport, in the, case of, in the case of both of them, to be independent states. Uh, Kosovo, as you know, declared independence in 2008. Uh, Bosnia was uh, given its constitution in 1995. But if you read the constitution of Kosovo uh, and the declaration of independence of 2008, you will see that Kosovo declares itself to be subject to a whole range of international organizations and above all, to the international civilian representative. In other words, the international governor, who is in fact responsible for the government of Kosovo. So the Declaration of Independence of Kosovo is in fact a declaration of dependence on NATO and on the other, on the European Union and on the other organizations which in fact run that territory. The same goes for Bosnia. You may not know this, but what are we now, 25 years after the Bosnian war ended, there is still, as in Kosovo, 20 years, more than 20 years ago, there is still an occupation force. There is NATO in Kosovo and the EU with hundreds of soldiers in Bosnia. So these are fictitious states. The European Union is a fiction. We saw the reality on the 9th of February, shortly before the Ukraine war broke out. The German Chancellor went to Washington. He gave a press conference with Joe Biden. And Joe Biden said, if Russia invades Ukraine, it's the end of Nord Stream 2. Joe Biden said, we will put an end to it. We will put an end to it. He said it in front of the German Chancellor, and the German Chancellor said nothing. In other words, the energy policy of Germany, and therefore of many other European countries, because the plan with Nord Stream 2 was to import gas uh, into Germany and for Germany to become a hub, I imagine, for countries like the Netherlands. 
The energy policy of Germany, which is a bilateral issue between Germany and Russia, is decided by the United States of America. So the European Union, of which we have been told for 20 years that it has a flag and a currency and a president and a foreign minister and so on, is in reality under the control of the United States of America. Fiction, control. And what is happening in this war is a conflict between fiction and reality. That's what wars do. They bring, they are a reality check. They are a, a moment when reality bursts in and we hope destroys uh, the various fictions that have been created. Why do I say Ukraine is a fiction? Ukraine is a fiction uh, for uh, a whole host of reasons, including historical reasons. I promise you I'm not trying to upset anyone or be provocative or hurt anyone's feelings, um, but uh, the Ukrainian state for a hundred years has had a fictional existence, or rather the Ukrainian state has served above all a fictional purpose. Uh, Many people uh, may not know this, but um, Ukraine, unlike Poland, people often think that Ukraine and Poland is more or less the same thing with respect to Russia and the domination of, of those territories. It's very important to understand that Ukraine never had any administrative existence before the creation of the Soviet Union, unlike Poland. In the Russian Empire, and even in the Russian Republic, before the October Revolution, Poland was an administrative unit. The Kingdom of Poland was, a, was a, an administrative unit. There was no administrative unit called Ukraine in the Russian Empire. There were simply different, different, different governorates. So Ukraine did not have any existence. It only came into existence, it came into existence for the first time on the 9th of February 1918, when the Ukraine People's Republic signed a a peace treaty uh, with the Germans. And Ukraine became, in as much as it existed, which in fact it did not because it only controlled a small territory, it became a puppet state. It was occupied by Germany and it became a puppet state. In the Soviet period, uh, when uh, Bolshevik power was re-established over Ukraine, and by the way, this uh, February treaty signed with the Germans was the prelude to the March treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which was, of course, a viciously punitive uh, treaty imposed on Russia by Imperial Germany, taking away the control of Ukraine and the Baltic states and so on. In the Soviet period, Ukraine uh, performed a different fictional function. Uh, it was part of Stalin's nationality policy to create the illusion, the fiction, that the Soviet Union was a collection of nations coming together, a collection which was expected to uh, encompass the whole world. That's why the Bolsheviks federalized the Russian Empire, it was to create the idea that the nations of the world were uniting in what would become a world unit. So Ukraine had a fictional, the Ukrainian state, the Ukrainian socialist, Soviet Socialist Republic, had a fictional purpose at that time. The third occasion when Ukraine came into existence was uh, on the 30th of June 1941, if you can call it coming into, 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 into existence, when the leaders of the uh, Ukrainian nationalist movement uh, signed an agreement or proclaimed that they would work together with Adolf Hitler for the creation of a new Europe and so on. Uh, and then, uh, as you know, uh, obviously the Soviet power was restored and the Socialist Republic continued until independence in 1991. Why am I going into all these historical details? It is not, I'm certainly not intending to deny, I do not deny, that there are people who consider themselves to be Ukrainians and not Russians. There is in particular uh, a territory which was incorporated into Ukraine in 1945 which had never been Russian, at least not for centuries. And it's quite natural that people who live in that part of Ukraine uh, have a national identity which is 
opposite to and perhaps even hostile to that of Russia. But the whole point about Ukraine is that there is no single national identity. To be Ukrainian means one thing in Lvov and the opposite in Kharkov. Ukraine in that sense is very similar to Ireland or Cyprus or Bosnia for that matter. To be Irish uh, means one thing in Belfast and something else in Dublin. Everybody knows that. All right? So uh, the, um, the, the notion, uh, of course there is, yes, I, I don't deny there is a Ukrainian nation, uh, but unfortunately there is no agreement between the inhabitants of Ukraine on what that nation exactly is and above all on what its relationship should be to Russia. Now I mention all these historical things not to justify the war, uh, because uh, the Russian Federation has lived for 30 years now with an independent Ukraine. Uh, it's not that which, it's not the existence or non-existence of a national identity uh, in Ukraine which justifies the intervention. Uh, I mention it instead to ask you to concentrate on this notion of, of fictionality or, or fiction hiding the reality of control. Because what is the reality of Ukraine? The reality of Ukraine uh, is, or was before the war, and since August 2021, that all members of the judiciary in Ukraine are selected with the participation of foreign judges, British, American, Germans, and so on. There is no country in the world, there is no sovereign country in the world whose judges are appointed by foreigners. It is proof, if you like, of the fictional nature of Ukrainian independence or sovereignty. Ukraine is not sovereign. Ukraine, if it, if it can't even appoint its own judges, but instead has to uh, get uh, judicial appointments uh, um, validated by Britons and Americans and Germans, that is not an independent country. Another reality is that in, uh, or in uh, November, the Ukraine signed a military partnership with the United States of America, which has uh, been the framework for the payment of billions and billions of dollars uh, to, in military hardware going into Ukraine for the purpose of regaining its territorial integrity, in other words, getting the Russians out of Crimea and out of the Donbass, and and this is on the State Department website, in ensuring NATO interoperability. In other words, the purpose of the military agreement signed in uh, November last year was to bring Ukraine into NATO de facto, but not, of course, de jure, to ensure NATO interoperability. Same thing goes for the agreement, military agreement signed with the British in June 2021. That is the reality of this state. It is a state which is being armed uh, and which is controlled by external powers, Britain and America in particular, but of course the European Union as well. And it's obviously in that context that the current war broke out. Now, one of the uh, remarkable things about this war is of course that it is being fought in a completely hybrid way by the West. The West is, as we know, imposing sanctions. Uh, in other words, of course, arming Ukraine as well, but above all, the principal method is sanctions. And this use of sanctions, this use of, as it were, soft power, or at least economic power, is a wonderful illustration of this Western obsession of creating virtual reality. But as we all know, and as Thierry has just said, these sanctions are having a catastrophic effect on our own economies. Russia is doing fine. The cafes are full, everyone's perfectly happy. There'll be a, a few difficulties, I'm sure, here and there. Can't fly to Moscow anymore and that kind of stuff. But Russia is fine. Meanwhile, the gas price uh, in Europe was 35 euros per megawatt this time last year on the Rotterdam exchange. It's now 180 euros euros per megawatt. It was 35, it's now 180. It has multiplied by a factor of six. How can our economies survive 
such a shock, which comes uh, immediately after the terrible shock inflicted by the COVID restrictions. We are already drowning in debt. We are already uh, in an extremely weak situation. How is it possible uh, to contemplate an economy, uh, which of course, like all economies, is based on energy. The economy is nothing but energy plus work. All right. How is it possible to contemplate uh, uh, a already fragile situation where the debt is, uh, where, as I say, we are drowning in debt in our respective countries, if the gas price multiplies by a factor of six in the matter of one, in the matter of one year? It is simply suicide. People say Europe has shot itself in the foot. No, it shot itself in the head. <laughs> so this war is going to make some very uncomfortable realities become apparent very soon. You've probably heard they're going to switch off the streetlights in Augsburg and places like that. We are literally dealing with a uh, unprecedented situation, an unprecedented situation. Uh, and it is a source of great sadness to me that this has all been decided by the Americans and that the people who will suffer are, of course, primarily the, the, the Ukrainians themselves, but also the Western Europeans. With the price of oil and the price of gas going up, our economies will be completely flattened. This war, therefore, cannot be won by the West. It cannot be won. It will instead be lost, both in terms of Ukrainian territory, which Russia will continue to take, possibly even including Odessa, and therefore cutting off the whole uh, coast from what will remain then as, a, as the core of Ukraine, but landlocked. But more importantly, the war will be uh, won, in my opinion, by Russia for the reasons for which Russia is fighting the war. Because Russia is not fighting this war uh, for Ukraine, for Lugansk or Donetsk or whatever. Russia has far bigger war aims, and indeed so does the West in, in, rea in reacting to this war. And those war aims are to try to end the unipolar world. That's what Russian officials have been going on about for decades. Putin has been in power, as we know, for nearly 25 years. He came to power in 1999 uh, at the moment of Russia's greatest humiliation, shortly after the Kosovo War, shortly after the NATO attack on Yugoslavia, and shortly after the humiliating episode of the airport at Pristina, which, if you remember, Russian troops, troops took first, but were then uh, got rid of pretty quickly. Putin came to power at that moment. He's not going to last forever. In my opinion, some people think that uh, Russia had no choice but to invade uh, because uh, there was about to be an ethnic cleansing operation launched by uh, Ukraine. A lot of people say this, not, not Russians necessarily. I've heard friends of mine say this, that uh, the Ukrainians were rearming and were intending to retake the Donbass by force. It's possible. Personally, I think that Russia chose this moment because she thought, and I think she was right, that she could win, not just on Ukraine, but against the West in general. Don't forget, the Americans had only just left Kabul. They left Kabul in August after 20 years. They were chased out of Afghanistan, just as they had been chased out of Vietnam. I think that Putin took a very clear and, if you like, cold-blooded decision to strike when he thought the West was weak, which it is, which it is. And uh, the multipolar world, which the uh, Russians have said they want and which they have demanded again and again and again, Putin has said practically nothing else for the last 10 or 15 years, has now come into existence. Uh, many of you probably know Spinev Brzezinski's book, The Grand Chessboard. Uh, Thierry has mentioned it uh, in uh, Parliament recently in the committee hearing. The book is important because it explains why Ukraine is a key geographical, geopolitical pivot for the Americans. 
the Americans are convinced, thanks to Brzezinski, that you have to take Ukraine out of Russia's orbit in order to weaken Russia. It's exactly what he says here. That's the whole point about Ukraine. It uh, has a, an importance that goes far beyond uh, uh, any other country in his, in his, in his view. And uh, again, Thierry, you said this the other day. We must never, misunder we must never underestimate the importance of Ukraine uh, in, the American, in, the, in the American deep state. Trump was impeached over Ukraine in 2019. They tried to get rid of him in 2019 because they thought that he was going to abandon military support for Ukraine. Go back to the hearings. The person in the National Security Council who denounced Trump uh, after the phone call with Zelensky said, I was worried that our policy in Ukraine would change. They tried to impeach the President of the United States because of what they thought was his Ukraine policy. It is of absolutely key importance to them. But the Brzezinski book is extremely interesting for another reason. Not just that it explains the uh, importance of Ukraine. The importance of Ukraine, by the way, I should make this clear for Brzezinski, is that it is a key geopolitical pivot which will en enable the United States of America to maintain its global hegemony. Brzezinski is absolutely explicit. He wants America to have global hegemony, to have control over the whole world, specifically by controlling Eurasia. It's the whole Mackinder theory and so on. That is Brzezinski's theory, all right? And Ukraine is the key, all right? If you, who controls Ukraine controls the world kind of thing. It's all pretty crazy stuff. But he says here something absolutely incredible. He talks about various scenarios which might prevent this uh, hegemony from continuing. And he says this, it's on page 55. Potentially, the most dangerous scenario would be a grand coalition of China, Russia, and perhaps Iran, an anti-hegemonic coalition united not by ideology, but by complementary grievances. So American hegemony will end if Russia and China and other countries unite, not on the basis of ideology, but on the basis of, of, of uh, complementary grievances. That is exactly what has now happened. That is exactly what has now happened. Did you see how China reacted to the NATO strategic concept? NATO had a summit in Madrid last week, and uh, NATO said that China posed a systemic challenge to the world system. My God, if you look at the communique of the official foreign ministry spokesman of China, I've got it here. The NATO 2022 strategic concept has misrepresented facts and distorted the truth. It once again wrongly defied China as posing systemic challenges. It smeared China's foreign policy, etc., etc. Here is our message for NATO. Hyping up the so-called China threat will lead nowhere. China has not forgotten the criminal attack of NATO on the Chinese embassy in Belgrade in 1999. NATO must abandon its outdated Cold War rhetoric and so on. Look it up. You'll find it. Before the Ukraine operation started, Putin went to see uh, Xi Jinping in Peking and, I'm sure, explained what was going to happen and got his support. So the very scenario which Brzezinski said would uh, put an end to the American domination of Eurasia has now come to be. And just for the uh, little detail, it so happens that, as you know, because I've just read you the passage, uh, he says perhaps Iran as well. Well, guess what? At the BRICS summit uh, last week, which happened more or less at the same time as the G7, guess which country applied to join BRICS? Iran. So it is here. It is happening now. It is happening now. We are therefore at a absolutely key moment in world history. Uh, and as I say, Putin, I think, has developed, has devoted his presidency to this idea of finishing the unipolar world, of, of escaping from the unipolar world, and of creating a multipolar world. And I think that he has achieved that, and I think that, that of course, the conflict will, in a sense, never end, because even if the fighting stops and so on, 
the West will continue to uh, uh, dream of, uh, you know, pushing the Russians back out of the territories that they've conquered and so on. There's never any, never any permanent victories in diplomacy. But as far as the principal war aim is concerned, I think that that has been achieved. And as a way of proof, but perhaps you're convinced already, I would like to remind you that at the beginning of the conflict, a, a well-known Western statesman uh, took a very aggressive line and said, Putin must fail and Putin must be seen to fail. Who said that? Boris Johnson. Thank you very much.